Thank you. Um, I will certainly be playing for you tonight, but I, I would like to speak a little bit about our creative process and also briefly about the instrument that I have is a rather unique, if you, those of you recognize clarinet, it, it's a little bit longer and bigger. Um, so I first wanted to sort of clarify the role of a uh, performer because I, I think it, when you think of a performer, it, it's, it's a role of kind of replicating what's already been done many, many times, belongs to a, a museum. And I think really nothing can be further from the truth. And if you consider other uh, creative disciplines, say like an author writing a novel or painter who, who paints, um, the spectators or listeners uh, or readers have a chance to directly commune with those authors, a creator, through the medium of words or, or painted canvas. Um, however, in, 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 in music, uh, the composers write score, but really the, the actual product exists in conceptual form. It doesn't exist in our, our uh, time and space. So the, the, the process of uh, interpretation actually happens twice. So what the composers have written down, the performers study in various forms, and, and, and then the actual product is produced in real time, in, in present. So I'm, I'll be playing a piece by Mozart, who died a long time ago, 200 years ago. Um, but um, th th even though the score has existed for many hundred years, it is actually coming into the reality at this very moment. So I think it's, it's something that we all have to keep in mind. It's, it's very significant. Um, just going back to this a little bit, so I sort of named this process a uh, transcendental collaboration because I am actually coll collaborating with uh, Mozart in this case. And um, it's a very heavy responsibility and also opportunity for, for the audience because what's happening is one of these great composers of our civilization uh, wrote this piece at the later time when he's very mature and, and refined. So we, we are sort of seeing this uh, very best of ideas maybe ever existed and that exists in conceptual form that is literally being brought to life at this very moment and you're taking a part in that as well. Um, just to, to move on with time, I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, clarinet concerto. It's arguably the most famous piece ever written for the instrument and um, as a lot of this interesting stories, the, the biggest problem for us is that the, the manuscript of this uh, concerto was lost during the course of uh, history. In fact, very early on, uh, Mozart wrote this for his great friend and clarinetist Anton Stedler, um, and Mozart was very generous to him. He loaned him money, um, gave him this manuscript to pay for his bills. Stedler was not that nice. <laughs> So um, the story, the speculation is that pro he probably pawned this manuscript, which was very valuable even during his time, and it was really forever lost. Um, so really what exists uh, left me, uh, for us is a sketch of his earlier sketches, we call uh, Winterthur sketches, it, it's in Switzerland, and um, earlier editions of the work. <clears throat> so really there, there shouldn't be any problem, but there are a lot of uh, inconsistencies in, in those two. So some notes in this sketch goes further down below the existing range of the instrument. So what are we supposed to do? And, and if you study music, there are a lot of times where, um, by the way, this sketch only exists for a small fragment. So the second movement doesn't exist at all. But if you look at the second movement from the later edition print, there are times where the music is very unnatural. Mozart would never do something like that. So suddenly the phrase turns upside down. Um, instead of going down straight, it goes to seventh. And I'll show you some examples how, how oddly this sounds. Um, so the scholars in the early 20th century um, sort of based on very highly educated guess and speculation um, discovered that the, the, the piece was actually written for a special clarinet that belonged to Anton Stedler. Being one of the first virtuosos of the, the instrument in um, late 1700s, he sort of asked the instrument makers to make a super clarinet for himself. So it's not a conventional instrument. And we only have sketch, a vague sketch of the instrument that looks like that. Um, the actual instrument does not even exist. Um, so there is some historical reconstruction of that instrument that looks like that. Um, and you can probably see that it looks really odd. It's very difficult to play, not highly practical. So um, th there are modern recreation of that instrument that enables performers to play lower so that we can actually play this, the, the score as it is written. And um, that's the instrument that I have. I think I exaggerate a little bit when I said only 30, probably hundreds, but it's very rare because the instrument only is there to, uh, to, to play for the Mozart concerto or quintet. And um, very few people would uh, buy a very expensive instrument for that purpose. Um, <laughs> I had a very fortunate instance to acquire this for myself. So um, I'll just show you one example where um, the 
the modern edition of the uh, second movement, one passage that goes like this. Thank <laughs> you. 